Welcome. This is Volunteer for Israel's 135th episode today. And I just have a couple of announcements. I don't know if Alana will be joining us today. Her dad is still in a hospital situation and that's a ongoing problem. I do have a couple of VFI announcements before we go forward with our program, which I'm very much looking forward to. First announcement is the VFI Plus Advanced Program is up and its date is from May 6th to May 22nd. The out-of-pocket cost for the all-inclusive program is 2,900 bucks plus your airfare. That's it for 17 days in Israel, which includes eight days touring with Miss Julia. So I want you to know that you can sign up with a $500 deposit now, or we are gonna max out with about 16 people. And there was an, already a number of people signed up. So if you're interested, uh, give Ilana a call, and get on the rolls fast. Second announcement is that the VFI plus archeology span program starts this Sunday. And so one and a half hours from now, me and my granddaughter, Mina, are heading off to the airport. And we will be flying out tonight at nine o'clock We'll be in Israel tomorrow afternoon about two o'clock, and we look forward to uh, seeing a bunch of people, including Julia, finally, after two years. We'll spend our first week on a military base. It turns out we're in the Negev, uh, near Beersheba, at an army base for one week, and then we'll spend the second week digging in Old City, Jerusalem, uh, with the Professor Yuval, who's the head of the archaeology department at Tel Aviv University, and they've laid out a wonderful program for us. So that. VFI plus archaeology program will run again in the fall. We don't have dates yet, but it'll be sometime in the fall. It would not run anywhere near any of the Jewish holidays. We're trying to piece it in there. Um, I think VFI? that's the bulk of our, well, one last announcement is that next week will be the last episode of, of uh, season three, and we will start season four at the very beginning of May. We're gonna take April off. We're gonna give <laughs> Julie a break. <laughs> So during April, we will continue to have the Shmoo sessions at two o'clock on Thursday afternoon. Hi, Alana. Hi. Can you make and, me host? Uh, I will. I will okay. in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, so we will continue to have the uh, the, the uh, Shmoo sessions, but with no particular content. You'll receive some email describing that. Those are the uh, messages I have. Alana, do you have anything to add? I didn't hear all of them, so okay. I don't think so. But I'll put my. Um... We already have a bunch of signups for the advanced trip. And if you'd like to talk to me about it, I'm happy to talk about it. I'll put my right. information in the chat. Um, and Pam, can you help me with the chat during the program? Okay. okay. We will okay. take uh, questions at the end of Ms. Ms. Nixana's uh, presentation. And uh, over to Julia. Steve, Steve first. Yes. Can yes. you make me, am I recording? Are you recording already? I'm recording now. We're good. You can make me host. Uh, I will. All right, thanks. Okay, Hi. over to Julia. Um, good evening, everybody. Welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to see you again over Zoom. I'm so excited to uh, to know that I will see uh, Steve and a few more people in reality real soon. And right now, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Nitsana Darshan Leitner. Bernie, the uh, so well-known lady, one of the uh, most famous attorneys in Israel. Uh, Nitsana Darshan is an Israeli attorney, human rights activist, and the founder of Shuat Hadin Israeli Law Center. She has been leading the legal fight against terror financing, the boycott, and the investment campaigns, the BDS, and combating the multitude of lawfare tactics um, utilized again the Jewish state enemies. Um, with no further delay, again, thank you so much for joining us and uh, it's all yours, Nitsana. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you, Julia. Thank you, Steve. It, you can take me off as a host because I hear all these bips coming in and um, I'll be uh, much better without them. In order um, to, are you gonna be sharing your screen? No. Oh, okay. Then we yeah. don't need to do that. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So good evening, uh, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, send my appreciation to uh, you guys for this uh, amazing organization. Um, joining the IDF, volunteering, uh, supporting the country 
supporting our military is um is is elevating it's uh it makes us israelis happy to know that there are a lot of people out there that support our cause and believe in the jewish state and the right for it to exist so thank you um if you watch around the uh, uh, russian ukraine war you can understand that uh, there is one tool that the west is using against russia it's not sending soldiers it's hardly um providing weapon or ammunition the undivided tool that everybody is using in the west is financial sanctions is hardening the financial situation of russia is blocking them from utilizing their currency foreign currency banking systems swift all these financial infrastructures is becoming more and more difficult for russia and this is the only thing that may collapse russia in the end the one that invented this idea one that told the world that there is another way to fight the evil another way to bring lawless regimes to their knees is the money following the money blocking the money is mayor the gun mayor the gun was the uh, uh, former legendary head of the mossad in 1996 it was only a uh, small officers uh, in uh, in the prime minister's office uh, it was the uh, uh, advisor for the arab affairs in the prime minister's office but in 1996 it was the first intifada there was a lot of terrorism in israel people were, were killing innocent civilians on the streets in bus bombing in drive-by shootings everywhere and mayor dagan was thinking how can he stop this terrorism how can he find it alternative way maybe creative one to block this murderers attacks and he came up with this idea of fighting terror financing he understood that money is oxygen for terrorism and if you stop the flow of the money you can stop the flow of the terrorism so he decided to build up a unit in the israeli intelligence that will consist representatives of the Shabak, of the Mossad, of the um, military, of the intelligence, even the ministers, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of uh, Justice. And together, all these representatives will sit down brainstorming how to fight terror financing, how to block this flow of the money. He realized that money really drives the entire operations of the terrorists. So he went to Prime Minister Netanyahu, he was Prime Minister in 1996, asked him to form this unit, Netanyahu agreed, and they called it Harpoon. Harpoon was a secret unit until we wrote a book about it. Harpoon's mission was following the money, target the money, kill the money. In 2002, in the midst of the Intifada, Harpoon really came to action. And they decided to go after Arafat's money in tricks and con games that you cannot imagine. So to be an example one. Um, 2002, if you guys remember, was the peak of the Intifada in Israel. It was a Dolphin Arm discotheque with 28 teenagers getting killed. It was a moment cafe in Jerusalem, 18 young people over coffee getting killed. It was the Park Hotel in Natania, 30 guests over Passover Center getting massacred. Ariel Sharon was a prime minister. He was desperate. Hundreds of people were getting killed on a monthly basis. 
So Mayor Dagan approached, uh, Ariel Sharon approached Mayor Dagan, who was the head of the Mossad, and uh, asked him how to fight this terrorism. And Mayor Dagan told him, if you really want to go after the infrastructure of the terrorism, let's use Harpoon. So the first mission they did was trying to steal Arafat's money. And they did it like this. They went and opened um, a, an office of investment fund in a South American country. They rented offices. They rented furnitures, beautiful furnitures. They hired beautiful secretaries. And they invited Muhammad Rashid, who was the financial advisor of Yasser Arafat at the time, to come and introduce him to this investment company. Muhammad Rashid came, he was introduced, he learned what lucrative uh, uh, benefits he can get, what high interest he can get for investing with them, how personal benefits he himself will get if he uh, agrees to invest with them. And Muhammad Rashid, who was very cautious, agreed to invest Arafat's money with this investment fund. And indeed, after a couple of months, they started receiving very high interest, lucrative benefits, uh, personal benefits. So he invested more money of Yasser Arafat in this company. And one day, he made a random call to the company and nobody answered the phone. He called the following day and nobody answered the phone. He went to this country in South America looking for the offices. There was no offices, no company. $400 million of Arafat's money disappeared somewhere. There are a lot of operations that they did, like robbing banks in Judea and Samaria that they believe belonged to the terror organizations. They, in 2006, during the second Lebanese war, they bombed banks from the air that they believe that are holding Hezbollah's money. They were assassinating uh, people, but not the terrorists themselves, they were assassinating those who dealt with the money. Mayor Dagan made it very, very clear that there is no white collar job in the organization. Everyone is a target, including or mainly the money people. I had a front seat watching the operations of Harpoon by heading the Shurat Adin Law Center. I started my work in this field in the year of 2000, in the beginning of Antifada, where the blood was spilled on the streets and the government, as I said, was desperate. People were afraid to walk on the street. People were afraid to go and sit in cafes. People were afraid to shop in the malls. And I just finished law school, was a young lawyer. Me and my friend realized that we cannot let the Palestinians just kill us, that we have to fight back. And as lawyers, we thought that perhaps we can take the world and in the war against terrorism by doing what lawyers do best, go after pocketbooks of the terror organizations. In the end, money is the oxygen to terrorism. We will try to bring these lawless regimes into court, get judgment against them, and then block their funding, put liens on their assets, confiscate their assets, making them pay. We just were waiting for the right case to come and this did not take too long. October, 2000, two soldiers, Israeli soldiers, made their way to their base in Big Tail. They did not know their way so well, but they made a mistake. They wound up in the city of Ramallah. In Ramallah, they were taken out of their cars, and were brought to the police station in town. 
Very quickly, the rumor was spread that there are two Israeli soldiers arrested in the Palestinian police station. The mob began to arrive, <clears throat> demanding the, the Palestinian policemen to bring them down the two soldiers. They wanted to lynch them. But the Palestinian policemen refused. Instead, they did the lynch by themselves. They used any tool they found in the police station, metal poles, sticks, guns, knives, and for half an hour, they were stabbing and beating the soldiers to death. But the mob demanded blood. So they took one of the soldiers, Vadim Norajit was about to become a father for his first time and threw his body from the second floor into the crowd. The mob ripped out the body to shreds. They took out the internal organs of the body. They dragged the body to the center of town and laid it on fire. By the end, when the body was turned into the Israeli forces, there was almost nothing left to say Kaddish. That was the case we were waiting for. Because in any normal country, the police and the state will be far responsible for this horrible lynching. It looked clear to us that the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian police have to pay a lot of money for this murder. So we find the case in the District Court of Jerusalem. And the Palestinian Authority hired lawyers, came to court and defended itself. Later on, we find more cases against the Palestinian Authority and also against Iran and Syria and the United States. These countries don't have sovereign immunity. You can sue them on behalf of American citizens. And within two years, we started winning in court. People were amazed because in the beginning, they said, what are you doing? How are you bringing terror organizations into court? You try to impose a law on those who don't care about anything, about human rights, about human life. They would care about the court of law. But after two years, we started winning in court. We won a judgment against Iran for $180 million that we were able to, um, to collect. We um, won a decision on the Lynch case uh, against the Palestinian Authority that allowed us to put a lien on 64 million shekels of their money right now to secure our judgment in the future. We got unprecedented decisions saying that the Palestinian Authority is not a state, they don't have sovereign immunity, they cannot be sued, they can be sued in Israel and the United States. And then we were approached by Harpoon, by their agents, who told us that they have been following us for the past two years, and now they realize that the financial war really can work, and perhaps we can collaborate with them. In the course of their operations, they said they gained a lot of evidence, a lot of documentations that prove wire transactions from the headquarters of Hamas in Syria, in Jordan, to the hands of the Palestinian organizations in the West Bank and Gaza. They saw wire transactions coming and bringing millions of dollars from Europe, from United States into the West Bank and Gaza. They wanted us to utilize this information to make use of these documentations, to bring them to court and to take on more cases against the Palestinian Authority and to take those who really wire the money, who are really responsible for these uh, transactions, the banks. I couldn't do it as a private lawyer anymore. We established Shurat Hadin, Israel Law Center, a non-for-profit organization to take all these hundreds of cases and find them in orderly manner in the courts of Iraq. Since then, we are presenting hundreds of terror victims in losses and legal actions against Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Authority, Iran, Syria, North Korea, Arab banks, European banks, Lebanese banks, Chinese banks, even the social media, Google, Twitter, YouTube, fighting terrorism in court. 
I will tell you about a portion of these cases. Um, Ella Bukasis was 17 years old when she was walking one day with her brother, 15 years old, coming back from a youth movement in Sderot when the red alert went on. This is the alarm that goes on when the missiles are falling from Gaza. In Tel Aviv, where I sit, we have 90 seconds to find a shelter. In Ashdod, a little bit southern than here, we have 60 minutes to, uh, seconds to find a shelter. And in the road, which is right on the border, you have 15 seconds to find a ship. So she was walking down the street. It was a bare street. There was no building, no bus to hide underneath them. The only thing that went into her mind is to protect her brother. She fell on her brother. She covered him. The missile fell right near their heads. Many shrapnels went into their both heads. She fought for seven days on her life in the hospital. She died. Her brother at this age of her life. We were asked by Harpoon if we can file a lawsuit against a major international bank that facilitated transaction to Hamas at the time. We agreed we filed a lawsuit in the federal court in New York on behalf of 150 terror victims that were killed or injured by Hamas. And we recently reached an agreement. The uh, father of Allah Bukasis came to me. He thanked me. He said, thank you for letting me fight back. Thank you for getting me my integrity back. I feel I'm no longer a victim. And this is what these cases do. They enable the victims to fight back. They enable them to receive a measure of closure, a measure of justice. No money can bring back life. But if there is anyone that deserves to take the money from this evil regimes, are the terror victims. Our victory were just, was just in the beginning because not only this thing closed down the accounts for Hamas, this loss was a shockwave through the international banking system that no bank agreed anymore to open bank account to designate the organizations. And no bank agreed to operate in terror zones like Gaza. There is no banking system in Gaza. This is why the system is smuggling money in suitcases, through the tunnels, through the borders, through Qatar. Um, but this is not enough. Hamas needs to bring hundreds of millions of dollars into the Gaza Strip to support the population, to support his military, to support his prisoners who are sitting in the Israeli jail, and to bring more and more weapon and ammunition into Gaza. Hamas budget used to stand on $1 billion. It's no more the case because of our case. I was told by the security services in Israel, that as a result of our cases, money diverted to terrorism reduced in Gaza in 60%. And anytime Hamas finds a bank that helps or wants to help him to bring money into Gaza, we go and find a lawsuit against this bank in the federal court in New York. We have cases against Iran, Syria, North Korea, these regimes don't come to court. They don't defend themselves. We win judgment against them for hundreds of millions of dollars. And the big question is, how do you collect? So we find assets. We find bank accounts that belong to Iran. We find buildings like something in New York called 655th Avenue. It's a high rise waiting to be sold. Process will go to the terror victims. Uh, Boeing that signed an agreement to sell 80 aircraft for $17 billion to Iran. We came to the court in Chicago, put a lien on this deal. We said we have a judgment against Iran. We are entitled to the Iranian money or to the aircraft. Wherever as a result of our efforts to collect more than $300 million that went to the hands of the terror victims.
This case against the Palestinian Authority that we filed back then in 2000, we won only now, but we won it. We have a judgment finding the Palestinian Authority responsible for this act of murder, along with additional 15 terror attacks. And we were able to put a lien for half a billion shekels on the Palestinian Authority's money to secure our judgment. In the United States, we also want judgment, but it's a bit a different story. Jonathan Bauer was seven years old when he was walking one day with his father, coming back from a doctor appointment. They were heading home in Jaffa Street in Jerusalem. It was 2001 when a wild, wild um, high man, wide shoulders came and crossed them. What they didn't know back then was that the guy was a Palestinian policeman. They also didn't recognize he was wearing an explosive vest. And in the vest, they had bolts and nuts and screws as much as it can carry. And then the man looked at Jonathan's eyes and blew himself up. Jonathan lost his conscience. It was rushed to Shari Tzedek Hospital in Jerusalem. And for four days, the doctor had many operations on him, trying to take out all the bolts and nuts and screws that went into his hand and his arm and in his leg. In the end, after four days, the doctors woke him up. They told the parents that there is one less screw remaining in his head that they were too afraid to take it. Today, Jonathan talks. He doesn't talk like we do. He walks. He doesn't walk like we do. He's disabled for life. We, um, that wasn't the only case or only terror attack that was perpetrated by a Palestinian policemen. In the beginning of the Intifada, during the four first years, many, many, many attacks were done, perpetrated, assisted by employees of the Palestinian Authority, policemen, security guards, security officers. So we took a bunch of them and filed a lawsuit against the Palestinian Authority in the federal court in New York. And the uh, Palestinian Authority hired a lawyer, they filed a motion to dismiss, the motion to dismiss was denied, they went to discovery, the position, seven years, and in the end, the case went to trial. It was a jury trial. It opened in January 2015 in New York. And uh, the Palestinian Authority had a, a defense. They said, Indeed, they were our employees, but they were rogue employees. They did the attacks after work hours. It wasn't our policy to kill Israelis. We did not authorize them to kill Jews. But when the trial opened, he found it hard to explain the jury. If they were rogue employees, how do you keep paying their salary until today? These terrorists who were involved with the terror attacks were tried in Israeli court, now sitting and serving their sentence in Israeli jail, receiving a salary from you month after month. You promote them in rank every three years. You pay stipends to the families of the suicide bombers. You call town squares and streets on the names of the suicide bombers. This is not how you treat rogue employees. This is not where your policy is against killing Jews. The case lasts 50 days. Day after day, we sat there in the court. I spent the coldest months of my life in New York, but I was shivering inside. I was so scared that the jury will not get the picture and will not find the Palestinian Authority responsible for this horrific terror attacks. We took a big risk by filing this lawsuit in New York and demanding a jury trial. And in the end, the jury went back to the liberation 
When they came back after three days, they found the Palestinian Authority responsible for this act of terrorism and gave us a judgment against them for $655 million. The uh, Palestinian Authority, we were in shock, but the Palestinian Authority was in shock as well. They immediately fired their law firm from Washington, D.C., and hired a new one from New York and filed an appeal. In the United States, in order to file an appeal, you have to pass a bond for the entire amount of the judgment. The Palestinian Authority said that they don't have $655 million to pass in the court. So they reached out to the State Department for help, and the State Department, which was under Obama's administration, helped. The State Department came to court, filed a motion, a statement of interest, saying that the Palestinian Authority is a national security asset of the United States in the Middle East. They want it to exist to the side of the state of Israel. They don't want it to go bankrupt. And they asked the court to be considerate. And the court was, instead of $655 million, the court imposed $10 million bond. So now the way was open to the Palestinian Authority to come and argue its appeal. They did not argue against the jury verdict or against the expert reports we filed in the case or the tone of documentations we find or the testimonies of the victims. They argued one technical argument, personal jurisdiction. They said, United States court do not have jurisdiction to litigate a case against the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority is not present in the United States. They don't have any connection to the United States. No businesses, no representations, nothing. And the Court of Appeals had a dilemma. Because on one hand, we find this case based on the Anti-Terrorism Act. This is a law from 1996 that Congress legislated that allowed American victims that were killed or injured abroad in terror attacks to bring their cases in the United States against terror organizations which are outside of the United States. It's an extraterritorial jurisdiction law. On the other hand, there is the American Constitution. Due process, you need personal jurisdiction. But having in front of them this letter from the State Department that said in these words or others, whatever you impose on the Palestinian Authority, they don't have the money to pay, went the Court of Appeal and vacated the judgment. We didn't stop. We went to the Supreme Court. We filed a motion for a writ. And the State Department, knowing that there is a new pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, now there is a new administration, Trump, went to the State Department and asked their opinion, perhaps to change it. But the State Department came with the same opinion. They said, this law is unconstitutional. You need personal jurisdiction. And the Supreme Court rejected our rights. But we did not stop there. We went to Congress and told them that there is a problem. There is a problem because we litigated this case for 15 years based on a law that they legislated it was a very well intended law, but now the court found it unconstitutional. So they have to fix the problem. And their way to fix the problem is to reinstate personal jurisdiction, to come and say that if the Palestinian Authority wants to keep receiving aid from the United States, they have to be deemed to consent to personal jurisdiction. Congress legislated this law. President Trump signed on, on the law. And now we are back in court. Supreme Court handed down the judgment to the federal court to decide whether there is personal jurisdiction or not. We will litigate this until the end. It will reach again the United States Supreme Court. 
but I already know that the Palestinian Authority's leaders could not believe how the little support they gave the terrorists before the attacks, how the money they paid them after the attack, turned in the end of the day to hundreds of millions of dollars in judgments against them. <coughs> we have cases against the social media. Um, I don't know how many of you visit Israel in 2015, but if you were walking down the streets at that time, October, November 2015, you would not dare to walk the streets without looking back that somebody is following you with a knife. A lot of Palestinians were stabbing Jews and they continue these attacks until today. Just the day before yesterday, a Palestinian, an Arab, Bedouin Arab, from the southern part of the country, carried out a knife and murdered four innocent people. Those years, the beginning of this, what we call knife intifada, if you look at the perpetrators, if you look at these Palestinians, you'll find that you're talking about very young people, 15 years old, 16 years old, teenagers. And you wonder what brought these teenagers to go to the mother's kitchen, grab a knife, and go and kill a Jew. And you realize that there's an incitement to kill. Incitement that this teenager received on their iPhone, on their PC, in their living room. Posts on the social media calling to kill Israelis, to murder Jews, to stab them, and videos that teach you how to stab what poison to put on the knife before you go and step, how to twist the knife, where to ambush the Jew, and songs and heroic shows how they admire the terrorists and their terror attacks. Benjamin Netanyahu, who was the prime minister, called this intifada the Facebook intifada because Facebook was the most popular social media network among the Palestinians. His pleads, pleads to take this incitement down that he turned to Facebook with, it was turned down. Facebook say that they are only a bulletin board. They are not getting involved with the content. They are not getting involved with their users. They have no intention to take this incitement down. They are not a censor. So we took Facebook to court. We filed a lawsuit on behalf of five families that lost their loved ones in knife attacks in Israel. And we filed a $1 billion lawsuit against Facebook in New York. Facebook hired one of the best law firms in the United States, came and filed a motion to dismiss. They claimed that they were immune, immune according to the Communication Decency Act. This is the law that we all know now as 230, Section 230. You must have heard it in the news recently. Trump was calling to change it. The Republicans are outrageous because of this section. It grants blanket immunity to social media networks from content. That means that everyone can put anything they want on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and this social giants will be immune. You cannot sue them. They are not considered to be a publisher. You can sue a newspaper. You can sue the TV network. You cannot sue the social media giants. So we lost the case and we appealed it. And we lost the appeal, but we kept filing lawsuits. We filed a lawsuit against Google. We filed a lawsuit against Twitter. And just recently, a couple of months ago, 
we finally had a breakthrough. We were in the court of appeal in a case against Google, which owns YouTube. And one of the judges said, indeed, these giants could not be immune because they are involved with the users. They are involved with the content. This law from 1996 is too old. It should not protect them. And another judge sided with us with a need to change this law. So we are going to Supreme Court. And in the end, it will be the Supreme Court that will have to decide between these two laws. One is a Communication Decency Act that grants them blanket immunity. And the other one is the Anti-Terrorism Act that prohibits any American company from providing any social network or social services to a designated organization. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do, and we're doing it on behalf of the victims. Um, Halel Yafa Ariel was a beautiful girl, was an excellent student, a great ballet dancer. She was only 13 years old. One night, she had a performance in her community, Kiryat Arba. She went with her parents. She danced. There was a competition. She even won. And in the end of the night, they went back home to sleep. She didn't have school the next day. So she stayed in bed when her parents left to work. And then a terrorist from the nearby village entered the community. He did not do it through the front gate. He jumped over the fence, which alerted the security services. They came riding on their Jeep, looking for the one who infiltrated the community but they did not find him. He was hiding behind the bush. When they drove away, he got up. He went to the first house he saw. He tried to open the door. The door was locked, so he went through the window. He wound up in Halel's room. He was holding a knife, and he stabbed her 17 times in her bed until she died. He was 17 years old. He had a Facebook page. But before he went to stab, he wrote, death is a right and I deserve this right. We cannot let Facebook sit in their ivory tower in Palo Alto when the blood is spilled on the street of Jerusalem. We have to find them accountable. We have to teach them that it's a social network. They have social responsibility. And they have to take this incitement down because words can really kill. And as I said, in order not to make it an Israeli problem, we find losses against Google, against Twitter, for terror attacks are done by, done by ISIS. Because imagine ISIS without YouTube. Imagine ISIS without these beheading videos. Who would know about ISIS without these videos? Who would even care? It's all on the social media. CNN will not screen these horrible videos. New York Times will not post an ad recruiting militants to join ISIS. It's only on YouTube. It's only on Twitter. It's only on Facebook. And this has to stop. There should be zero tolerance or terrorism on the internet. And Shurat Adil is involved with other type of cases because when our enemies realize that they cannot beat us militarily and despite this horrific wave of terrorism they unleashed against us, we are still here. They started to use a different type of weapon non-conventional one, but a very devastating one. It's called BDS and Lawfare. <coughs> they call to um, single out Israel just to alienate it. They call companies, corporations, universities from all over the world to boycott Israel, to sanction it, to divest from it. They want to exchange 
the Jewish state with a Palestinian one. They don't call for a two-state solution, only one state solution, a Palestinian one. And they do it by calling to all the refugees that left Israel in 1948. There were 600,000 of them back then. Today, there are 6 million to come back to Israel, to settle in it under the slogan, let demography win. They don't want the Jewish state to exist. And they do it in a very democratic way, BDS. And it's very hard to fight it because they are protected by freedom of speech, by freedom of the organization, by academic freedom. Shurada Din file lawsuits when there is a way really to fight this BDS activists. Airbnb, for instance, when they boycott Jewish houses in Judea and Samaria, we went to court. We went to court because we realized that Airbnb's argument that they don't want to be involved anymore with occupied territories, and this is why they unleashed houses in Judea and Samaria, is a false argument because they don't do, they don't unleash houses in other occupied territories in the world, like Northern, Northern Cyprus, like Western Sahara. They also don't um, unleash houses that belong to other people, not just Jews, like Christians, Palestinians, Bedouin, Arabs, so this is an act of discrimination in the United States. There is a law called the Fair Housing Law that prohibits discrimination when it comes to housing. We filed a lawsuit against them in Delaware, and after three months, Airbnb came to us and asked to settle this case out of court. We reached an agreement, and Airbnb backtracked from its policy. They promised not to delist houses into dance. It was a big blow to the BDS movement. Ben and Jerry's, they decided that they don't manufacture ice cream anymore in Judea and Samaria. Once again, they don't want to be involved in occupied territories. And once again, I didn't see any announcement in regards to Western Sahara, Crimea, Georgia, and even now, Ukraine or Russia. So we decided to go after Ben and Jerry's trademark in Judea and Samaria. We said, if you don't want to use your trademark in this area, we will. And we will manufacture Ben and Jerry's ice cream in Judea and Samaria. The law, the trademark law says that you are entitled to register your company, your name, your trademark, only if you sincerely have plans to work in this area. It's a territorial law. Once Ben & Jerry's gave up their right for this trademark in this region, it's free. Anybody can take it. We are the first one to take it. We will manufacture ice cream of Ben & Jerry's in Judea and Samaria. We are thinking about names now. We came up with Frozen Chosen People and with the Yasser Arafaj. But the last one and the very devastating one is Lawfare, is what they're doing to us in the International Criminal Court. The Palestinians are suing Israel in the International Criminal Court in The Hague. They want to blame Israel for war crimes under two allegations. One is what the idea of doing in their operations. They are using excessive force against Palestinians, which is against the international law. And the other one is the settlement, which is a violation of the international law. We predicted this step 
We know that once the Palestinian Authority upgraded their status to an observer state in the UN in 2012, their only goal is to join the court and file war complaints against Israel. So we went to court and said, if the Palestinian Authority is there, they can be plaintiffs, but they can be defendants as well because the jurisdiction of the court goes two ways. It's a two-side street. So we went and filed lawsuits against the leaders of Hamas, of the PLO, of Islamic Jihad for acts of murder that committed against Israelis during the years of the Intifada. And we did something radical. We actually filed lawsuits against the head of the Palestinian Authority as well. Because when the court decided that they are investigating Israel to balance this, they declared that they are investigating Hamas. But I don't care about Hamas. I don't care about them because they themselves don't care about the court. Because there is nothing the court can do to Hamas leaders. They will hide in Gaza. They will not be like IDF soldiers who one day will be arrested in international airports because they are wanted by the International Criminal Court. They will not be by Israel, like Israeli officials. They will be scared to walk around the world because there will be Interpol warrants against them. They are terrorists. They will be hiding inside their bunkers. This is why they don't care. The one that we care is the one that stayed out of the court for some reason which is the Palestinian Authority. The court did not say they are going to investigate the Palestinian Authority. And the Palestinian Authority is the war criminal in this conflict. They directed the Intifada. They gave instructions. They incited. They called their people to go and kill Israelis. And they're doing it until today. Their pay to slay policy, encouraging people to go and kill Israelis. They awarding them with money. This is not incitement to terrorism. This is aiding and abetting terrorism. This is a crime against humanity. So we're filing losses against the Palestinian authorities' hands in the court. If the court really wants to dive into this conflict, he will have to do it against the Palestinian authorities. The other delegation is a little bit harder. If you bear with me for a second, the Palestinian claim that Israel violates Section 60, 49 of the Geneva Convention. Section 49 was enacted after World War II, after Nazi Germany took over huge parts of Eastern Europe and made a, a massive population transfer into this area. The section says that an occupying country cannot transfer its population into an occupied territories that they concurred. Palestinian Authority claimed that Israel, by moving its population to live in Judea and Samaria, which is an occupied territory, violated Section 49 of the Geneva Convention. Israel has a great defense. The territories are not occupied, right? In order to occupy a territory, you have to take it from someone who owns it, and nobody owned Judea and Samaria. The last one to have any ownership rights on this land were the Turks under the Empire, um, Ottoman Empire. But in World War I, in 1917, the British came took over this land and received a mandate to administrate this land. They did not have ownership on this land, just a mandate to administrate it until the Arabs and the Jews, the people who live in this region, will create their own states. After 25 years, they finished their term, they left and they led the Arabs and the Jews to fight between each other over this piece of land. The war broke out, the independence war in 1948. It lasted a year and a half, a bloody war. 
that ended with a ceasefire. And the border of the ceasefire, where the two armies stayed in the end of the war, was painted in green. And since then, it got the name, the Green Line. But this line did not have any political implications. Jordan, who saw that there is a very nice piece of land attached to its border, decided to annex it. It even gave it a name, the West Bank. It's the West Bank of the river. Jordan was in the east. But nobody agreed to this annexation. Everybody was furious at Jordan, even the Arab League. The only countries that agreed to this annexation were Pakistan and England that has great relationship with King Abdullah. In 1988, Jordan gave it up its right for this piece of land. So in 1967, when Israel took it over in the Six Days War, nobody owned it. It was no one land. So the only thing you can say about these territories is that there are designated territories, there are uh, disputed territories, but they are not occupied. However, unfortunately, the court will not accept this litigation. The entire world, except United States recognize these territories as occupied. This is why the court once starts an investigation against Israel on this argument, Israel will lose. And this will be a game changer. So we went and filed war on complaints against other countries that occupy territories. We said Israel is not the only country in the world to occupy territories. Turkey, as we mentioned before, occupies Northern Cyprus. We went and filed a war crime complaint against Turkey. And on 30 pages long brief, we wrote exactly what Turkey is doing in Northern Cyprus, how they build houses, how they build universities, how they build hospitals, how they give tax incentives to the residents to live in Northern Cyprus exactly what Israel is doing in the West Bank. The court will not indict Turkey. The court will not found Erdogan a war criminal. Turkey is a member of NATO. Turkey is too dear to Europe. What the court might say is that this type of disputes are unjusticiable. There, it's not for the court to get involved. It's for the countries to resolve them among each other. So when the court will come to deal with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict based on the same allegations, there will be a precedent. The hands of the court will be tied. There will be already a ruling saying that the court is not being involved in such type of conflicts. This is only a portion of the cases we are litigating in Israel, United States, Canada and Europe, every day, unfortunately, we receive more and more calls from terror victims that want to fight back, that they are seeking justice, and we are there to help them. And every day, we find Israel facing more and more challenges that the answer for them is in the legal arena. And we are there to serve as a legal arm of the state of Israel. We're doing it because the Israeli government cannot do what we do. The Israeli government cannot sue other governments, they cannot sue banks, they cannot sue terror organizations, they cannot be members in the International Criminal Court. They have international treaties that they have to take into consideration. They have foreign relationship. They have political interests. They have to be politically correct. We don't. We are private lawyers that represent private people that have one goal, to bankrupt terrorism, one loss at a time. And we will continue fighting terrorism and we will continue to fight on behalf of the state of Israel because we don't have any other choice. We live here. 
and we want to live here safely. We don't want to go to a gas station and get stabbed to death, as happened two days ago. We don't want to walk in our malls and get massacred, as the terrorists did to one of the victims two days ago. We want to sit in our cafes. We want to shop in our malls. We want to walk safely in our streets. This is our country, and it's the only one. And we are going to win because we are fighting for our national survival. And we appreciate all the help that people like you and people from the entire world can give us to make sure that the nation of Israel is finally living safely in the land of Israel. Thank you very much. Uh, Itana, thank you so much for uh, such uh, um, such an amazing uh, with the presentation for um, an inspiring one and for all the hard job you do, which is uh, truly so hard. So thank you for all you do. Thank you for your uh, presentation. We have uh, just a few questions now, which I believe uh, we will start having more and more um, soon. So first question would be, Harry asked, uh, how did your group come up with uh, lawsuits against terrorist groups? Uh, did it come from the Southern Poverty Law Center that for legal suits, which uh, bankrupt um, um, such group as the United Clans of America? I believe you understand better than I yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, was headed by the the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center was headed by Morris Jew, uh, Morris Dees, uh, when the Southern Poverty Law Center was a good word. There is not so much. They were fighting the Ku Klux Klan. They were fighting the neo Nazis, and they were going after those who uh, committed hate crimes uh, against the uh, the, the blacks. Uh, and we took the same idea. They were actually receiving judgments and they were going after the Ku Klux Klan and the neo Nazis' assets, money, property. They were uh, seizing their bank accounts. They were seizing their houses. They were seizing their rental agreements. They were seizing their cars. They even seized the name Ku Klux Klan. So we went in the beginning and went with Boris Dees and asked him how to do it. And he just told us he had to create a non-for-profit and to be able to manage and maintain all these cases through an NGO. And that the idea came from. Uh, so thank you. Uh, second question by uh, Harry. Do you have any concern for your safety because of your work? Um, I'm, I'm trying to be cautious. Um, when I go and speak, I make sure that there are guards in the door. I go in Europe, I don't publicize the event. Uh, here in Israel, I'm less concerned because uh, as we see, everybody can get killed anywhere and uh, in terms of assassinating specific me, I think there are higher ranked officials uh, than me and besides to come to Tel Aviv to find our uh, tower and to climb up the 13th floors will be a little bit hard for the terrorists to do. But in any event, we will continue to do what we do. There is nobody else to do it and we will keep fighting. Well, we have um, a thank you and kola kavod and chazak veimat. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, if we have any uh, further questions, ladies and gentlemen, I see that there are no more questions on chat. So, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask, uh, hi, uh, you are quite a lady. Hi, Steve here. I just wondered if you're still um, working in collaboration with Mossad. 
the uh, harpoon unit went from the Mossad and became under the Ministry of Defense. From time to time, we collaborate. Uh, it's not the heroic operations they used to do. It's more internal, going after Palestinians and their properties in uh, the West Bank. But when they need and seek our advice, we are there to help. I just recently met with the head of the Mossad, and um, any time they need some advice, some support, some idea, we're there. Great. Well, I, I just want to thank you for a, a sterling presentation. On the, uh, thank you very much. I, I urge you all to uh, go on our website, Shurat Adin Israel Law Center. Uh, just Google our name, go on our Facebook, read the book, Harpoon. It's in English and in Hebrew. And um, just join the fight to protect the Jewish state and continue to do what you do. And we may be in contact regarding the Mossad mission. Uh, yeah, we the... have this Mossad mission. It's coming up on May 23rd. It's an amazing mission. Uh, we meet with Mossad officials. We go to sites where Mossad has operations. We have uh, uh, we go to a military court to watch a trial of a Hamas terrorist, and we go to the Kiryat, to the headquarters of the uh, Ministry of Defense. We have a lot of uh, amazing inside uh, sites, stories, lectures. Just go on our website, learn what we do. Great. Maybe uh, we can work something out. Great. And thank you again. There's also, Harry had another part to his question. Um, the second part to his question said, do you see any future laws in the U.S. to deny terrorist groups social media platforms as what they advocate would deny free speech of those they attack? That's a, that is what we're trying to work on now. We're trying to get the Anti-Terrorism Act to overcome the Communication Business the Act. I don't believe there is a way to change the CDA. The social media giants had huge lobby in Congress. Palo Alto is too strong for anyone to harm this immunity. However, perhaps by changing the Anti-Terrorism Act, come and say that in terms of terror, in case of terrorism, it should not be immunity. Perhaps this is something that we can do, and this is what we're working on. I'm writing the name of the book on the chat because some people asked me for the name, yeah. so I'm writing it down. Thank you. It, it is interesting that so much of your work involves American Jewish Judas prudence. I, I would never have expected that, and I'm pleased to see that you're taking those positions. They're correct. Yeah, unfortunately, um, in any terror attack, there are American citizens that getting killed. You know, we have a lot of tourists from United States. We have a lot, and lots of students coming here for a gap year, coming here for one year program, coming here right after high school. A lot of our victims, unfortunately, are young, young, young people, uh, American citizens. And um, in the end, we are sisters. Israel suffered a lot from terrorism. The United States suffered in 9-11, tremendously from terrorism. And uh, I'm glad for the United States jurisdiction to allow American victims yeah. to litigate their cases in the United States. Hmm. Wow. So um, thank you very much. And um, continue visiting us and supporting us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you again. very much, Nita. Thank you so much. much for taking the time and giving this uh, thoughtful presentation. Uh, last to process, indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Great. Julia, would you like to speak about next week? Okay. Um, well, um, 
First of all, I would like to say that uh, it was your uh, request long, long ago to have uh, Nitana as our guest. It took me a long, long time, but eventually it did happen. And I think you did she it. Did. You did it. Yeah. I, um, she truly made a, a great job. I mean, both the presentation and, of course, uh, the work she's doing. So um, I'm glad it happened. So. Um, as, as I don't believe it, but you're going to be on your way to the airport soon uh, with Mina and uh, three others, three other um, brave volunteers. Unfortunately, I will not be around uh, Saturday. I'm going to uh, hike in the desert and send you an email. Mm -hmm. So I might, uh, I, I will see if I can. I will uh, come to Tel Aviv just to say hi before you leave for the base and uh, to the meeting place in Tel Aviv. But if I will not make it, so I'll see you, the five of you, um, Thursday. Right. We will meet Thursday, and we will drive to uh, up north. So it, it's amazing. But uh, next presentation, next uh, Zoom presentation will be virtually in Jericho and physically somewhere by the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> wait a minute if the next one is next thursday yeah and you're going to be meeting them how are you going to do that julia why not we'll be at a hotel yeah exactly we we're not camping oh yeah, yeah. by then you'll be at the hotel right? yeah yeah sure of course it's going to yes. be nine we are switching the time tonight so it will be yeah. back to 9 p.m Yep. Where, so, where are you staying? Which hotel are you staying at next weekend? Uh, Ginosau. Yeah. Ginosau, Kibbutz Ginosau, you know, uh, north of Tiberias. Yeah. Okay. So it's a beautiful place. I will have my laptop. And um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that will be so weird. I mean, some of uh, of the, the most devoted participants of the Zoom presentation, I don't know if you will make it or you'll be already in bed because you will... Maybe not jet lag, but he was supposed to be tired after an actual touring. So uh, I will uh, I will be there holding hands with Julia. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we will be sharing the same screen, which is so amazing. <laughs> I, mean, I don't believe it. It's actually happening. I mean, it's really, really my story. Wow, it's really something. Yeah. Two years later. Yeah. So uh, the content of. Like yeah, next week's contents, just to make it uh, clear what we'll be looking at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So next week content, you're right. Actually, I uh, should have started with it. Anyhow, next week, uh, IDF Edifice presentation will be uh, same place, same uh, time, and we will be visiting Jericho. We are going to Jericho, which is one of the most amazing, uh, one of the most ancient, of course, and the lowest city on earth. Uh, which is located, well, Nitana is no longer here, so I can safely use the term uh, occupied territories or disputed territories or the West Bank or whatever it is. <laughs> um, and of course, it is one of the uh, cities which, which are ruled by uh, Palestinian uh, authority, uh, one of the Area A's, so-called. Uh, so that's where we are going. We will be visiting a spring of uh, Elisha, and we will be visiting a uh, ancient uh, Greek Orthodox monastery oh, overlooking the plains of Jericho, and we will be visiting uh, the palace of Hisham, which is uh, which is an amazing archaeological site, which is a palace which has the most amazing mosaics. Uh, uh, ever found in Israel, I believe one of the most amazing mosaics uh, in the world. And um, we will see uh, a few more sites as well, including uh, the Hasmonean palaces. So uh, that's that's a really great tour. And uh, before you make it physically, we will make it virtually as we're already uh, used to doing. So that's next Thursday. Great. Well, Julia, thank you very much for today's presentation. Um, sure. um, thank you. Again. And 35. <laughs> I didn't know we could count that high. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Thanks. So I will. Uh, I will let you pack, Steve, and I will see you either Sunday or Thursday, but here in Israel. Okay. Um, Very good. 
Will Will you have your regular uh, phone number so I can uh, call you? Yeah. Uh, yes, my regular iPhone will work. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Great. So now all you need is not to test positive when you land because that will sort of ruin the plans. That right. so far so good. Yeah, so far so good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So please be careful and don't get COVID. Hi, Marcia. Take good care you. of him. Okay. I will. Just please make sure that he will not test positive. Hi, Sarah. This is Matthew Adler.